Welcome to a lesson on the inverse Laplace transform. From the previous lesson, we know the Laplace transform will allow us to convert a differential equation into an algebraic equation. Once we solve the algebraic equation in the frequency domain in terms of s, we will want to get back to the time domain t, as that is what we are solving for. Given a function big F of s, we wish to find a function little f of t, such that the Laplace transform of little f of t equals big F of s. From the uniqueness theorem, we know little f of t is unique. As a result, the definition follows. Suppose big F of s is equal to the Laplace transform of little f of t for some function little f of t. We define the inverse Laplace transform as the inverse Laplace transform of big F of s equals little f of t. There is an integral formula for the inverse Laplace transform, but it is not as simple as the Laplace transform itself. It requires complex numbers and path integrals. For us, it will suffice to compute the inverse Laplace transform using table 6.1 below. As an example, we are given big F of s equals one divided by the quantity s plus one, and we're asked to find the inverse Laplace transform. Looking at our table, we use the formula at the bottom of the first column, which I've enlarged here on the left, the Laplace transform of e to the power of negative at equals one divided by the quantity s plus a, in our case, notice a is equal to one, and therefore the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the quantity s plus one equals e to the power of negative one t, or just e to the negative t. As the Laplace transform is linear, the inverse Laplace transform is also linear. That is, the inverse Laplace transform of a times big F of s plus b times big G of s equals a times the inverse Laplace transform of big F of s plus b times the inverse Laplace transform of big G of s. Of course, we also have the inverse Laplace transform of a times big F of s equals a times the inverse Laplace transform of big F of s. Let us demonstrate how linearity can be used. For the next example, we are given big F of s equals s squared plus s plus one, all divided by the quantity s cubed plus s, and we're asked to find the inverse Laplace transform. We first use the method of partial fraction decomposition to write big F in a form where we can use table 6.1 to find the inverse Laplace transform. This indicates we begin by factoring the denominator as s times the quantity s squared plus one. Notice how we have a linear factor and a quadratic factor. So now we write the given function big F of s as a divided by s plus the quantity bs plus c divided by the quantity s squared plus one. Recall when we have a linear factor, the numerator is a constant, when we have a quadratic factor, the numerator is linear. And now for the next step, which I've shown here in blue on the left, we multiply both sides of the equation by the LCD, which results in the equation s squared plus s plus one equals a times the quantity s squared plus one plus the quantity bx plus c times s. And now we equate the coefficients, which I've done in the next line, because s squared must equal a times s squared, we know a is equal to one. We can also tell us by looking at the constant term one. And then we also know that bx plus c must equal the coefficient of s, which is one. This indicates that b is zero and c is one. And now we know the partial fraction decomposition is one over s plus one over the quantity s squared plus one. And now we take the inverse Laplace transform of both sides of the equation and use the property of linearity. And now we find the inverse Laplace transform of one over s and then we add the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the quantity s squared plus one. To find the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by s, we use the first formula in the first column where the inverse Laplace transform of a constant is equal to the constant divided by s. Notice in our case, the constant is one and therefore the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by s is equal to one. And then for the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the quantity s squared plus one, we use the first formula in the second column where the Laplace transform of sine omega t is equal to omega divided by the quantity s squared plus omega squared. Notice in our case, because the denominator is s squared plus one, omega squared and omega equal one, and therefore the inverse Laplace transform is sine t. And therefore the inverse Laplace transform of the original function big F of s is one plus sine t. Another useful property is the so-called shifting property or first shifting property which states the Laplace transform of e to the power of negative at times little f of t equals big F of the quantity s plus a where big F of s is the Laplace transform 
a little f of t. The shifting property can be used, for example, when the denominator is a more complicated quadratic that may come up in the method of partial fractions. We complete the square and write such quadratics as the square of s plus a plus b, and then use the shifting property. As an example, let's find the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the quantity s squared plus four s plus eight. To begin, notice the denominator doesn't factor, and therefore we begin by completing the square on s squared plus four s, which I've shown here on the right. To complete the square on s squared plus four s, we add half of the square of the coefficient of s, which is four, Half of four is two, two squared is four, and therefore we add four. But so that we don't change the expression, we now have to subtract four. And now s squared plus four, s plus four is a perfect square trinomial. It's equal to two factors of s plus two, and eight minus four gives us plus four. So now we know, look at our formula, we have big F of s plus two is equal to one divided by the sum of the square of s plus two and four. We also know a is equal to two, and big F of S, which is big F without the shift, is one divided by S squared plus four. And now in the formula above to find little f of t, we need to find the inverse Laplace transform of big F of S, which again is one divided by the square of S plus four. Looking at our table of formulas, more specifically the first formula in the second column, we have the Laplace transform of sine omega t is equal to omega divided by the quantity s squared plus omega squared. Notice in our case, omega squared is equal to four, and therefore omega is equal to two. Or more specifically, on the far left in blue, we now know the inverse Laplace transform of two divided by the quantity s squared plus four equals sine two t. But because our numerator is one, not two, the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the square of s plus four is equal to one half sine two t, which gives us little f of t. Now putting all the pieces together, where we know little f of t is equal to one half sine two t, we also know big F of s plus two is equal to one divided by the sum of the square of s plus two and four, as well as a is equal to two. We have the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the quantity s squared plus four s plus eight equals the inverse Laplace transform of one divided by the square of s plus two plus four, which using our formula is equal to e to the power of negative a t times little f of t, where in our case a is equal to two, and little f of t is equal to one half sine two t, giving us an inverse Laplace transform of one half e to the power of negative two t sine two t. In general, we want to apply the inverse Laplace transform to rational functions, meaning in the form of big F of s divided by big G of s, where big F of s and big G of s are polynomials. Since normally for the functions that we are considering, the Laplace transform goes to zero as s approaches infinity, it's not hard to see that the degree of big F of s must be smaller than that of big G of s. Such rational functions are called proper rational functions, and we can always apply the method of partial fractions. Of course, this means we need to be able to factor the denominator into linear and quadratic factors, which involves finding the roots of the denominators. But we also now know if the denominator is a quadratic that doesn't factor, we can try completing the square and using the shifting property. I hope you found this helpful.